Welcome to the Book of Life, a show about Jewish people and the books we read. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. In this May 2007 episode of our podcast, we celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month by taking a look at Jews and America's favorite pastime, the game of baseball. Jews have a long relationship with the game, and that relationship is still evolving, as evidenced by the establishment this year of the Israel Baseball League, a new professional baseball league in the state of Israel. In this episode, we'll hear from Carol Matus, author of the historical children's novel Play Ball. We'll meet Aviva Kempner, the independent filmmaker behind the documentary The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg. During our seventh inning stretch, we'll say hi to celebrate reaching our 18th episode. We'll finish up with a doubleheader on the picture book Across the Alley. First, we'll hear the book reviewed by Andrea and Mark of the podcast Just One More Book. Then we'll hear from the author himself, Rich Michelson. Let's play ball! Carol Matus is the author of over 30 books for children, many of which revolve around Jewish themes. In 2003, she began a trilogy of historical novels about a Jewish girl named Rosie and her immigrant family's adventures in America. Gotcha takes place during the 1909-1910 Union strike in New York, Play Ball shows the family after a move to Chicago, and Action follows them to Los Angeles, where they became movie-making pioneers. We spoke to Carol about the middle book in the series, Play Ball, by phone at her home in Winnipeg, Canada. Carol, tell us about Play Ball. Play Ball follows the story of Rosie and her family, who have just moved to Chicago, where Rosie's dad has set up a number of Nickelodeons. Rosie's brother is crazy about baseball. Rosie is a natural, but she can't play baseball because she's a girl. There's an injury on her brother's team, and they get this idea of letting Rosie come in as a ringer. Why did you choose baseball as the lens through which to examine Chicago's Jewish history? You know, I'm a baseball fanatic, and like most baseball fanatics, uh, I see a lot of parallels in life with baseball, and I'd always really wanted to write a baseball book but never had the opportunity. Um, Once I started writing the Rosie series, I wrote the first one about the strike and the shirtwaist factories and the tenements in New York. And when I got to Chicago, naturally the first thing I started to research was the Chicago Cubs, just because of my love of baseball. And the more I researched and read, the more I realized, wow, you know, they they all played baseball then, and it would be just a perfect setting to put it all into the format of a baseball game. Rosie's team, the Chavarim, and the opposing team, the Tigers, are both Jewish. Why is there so much antagonism between them? There was a large migration of German Jews to Chicago in the middle of the 1800s. And the large uh, migration of uh, Eastern European Jews didn't start until the beginning of the 1900s. So the German Jews were already very well established and very sophisticated when the new immigrants came in, they were poor, of course, like all immigrants are when they first arrived in the country, and the German Jews gave them a pretty hard time, although I have to say they took really good care of them. They set up agencies for them, they had loan societies for them, they, you know, they really took care of them, but there was a slightly, you know, paternalistic attitude towards them, which was that, you know, you're not quite as good as we are, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, the new immigrants resented that terribly. So there really was quite a rivalry. You know, from the research I did, you would see it playing out on the schoolyards, at the Jewish organizations, in ball games, and all that, in that sort of way. So it is uh, historically accurate to the time. You've given Rosie's team a very philosophical coach who spouts quotes from Jewish sages. What lessons does he help Rosie and the readers to learn? Well, Coach Kabrinsky is a student of Kabbalah and of Jewish philosophy. I think the main lesson that Coach Kabrinsky teaches is that one has to do the right thing for the right reasons. People often think that the outcome is what tells them whether they made the right choice or not. But in fact, you can't control the outcome. And of course, that's always the way in baseball. You can, you can hit something, right? And, 
somebody can snatch that away from you just before it goes over the wall. But that doesn't mean you didn't have a good hit and you shouldn't have tried to hit it in the first place. You can't control the outcome, but you can control your choices. And in terms of how you make those choices, Coach Kabrinsky also advises to do unto others as you'd have others do unto you, which is Hillel's admonition to when he was asked if you could put Judaism into a couple sentences. So I think that's what he's trying to teach them. Act in the best way you can and hope for the best. Rosie's family call themselves free thinkers, and they stand by Rosie's choice to play baseball with boys. Would that have been very unusual at that time? It wasn't as unusual as you might think. There were a lot of very, very progressive people at that time. Not only did some people break away from traditional religion, but in doing so, they also broke away from traditional values. And, yeah, there was a large, large segment of the Jewish population who were what they called free thinkers, and they were really proud of themselves. And I know in my family, some of them used to hang outside the synagogue and smoke cigarettes and sort of taunt people, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> apparently. I mean, this was like a hundred years, over a hundred years ago, but, you know, you still hear, hear stories. And uh, they were, you know, very proud of kind of breaking away from tradition. Um, Carol, what are you working on now? Well, I have two brand new books coming out. One is called The Whirlwind, set in 1941-1942 in Seattle. It's about a German Jewish family who flee Nazi Germany, then settles with his family in Seattle and makes uh, a best friend who is a Japanese American boy. And once Pearl Harbor happens and the Japanese boy is sent away, Ben fears that it's going to happen to the Jews all over again. And then I have another book out, totally different, called Past Crimes. It's about a 19-year-old Jewish single mom. Uh, she's got a little one-year-old. And it's a pretty scary thriller with flashbacks to the Spanish Inquisition and what happened to the Jews during the Inquisition. So set in Palm Springs, California. Carol Matus, thanks so much for speaking with us. Heidi, thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Independent filmmaker Aviva Kempner of the Cheshla Foundation trains her lens on lesser-known Jewish heroes. She's currently working on a film about Gertrude Berg, who created the popular radio and TV show The Goldbergs. Back in 1999, Aviva's film The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg hit a home run in movie theaters across the nation. We spoke to Aviva by phone at her home in Washington, D.C. Aviva, why did you choose Hank Greenberg as a subject for a documentary film? What about him called to you? Okay, well, I make films on underknown Jewish heroes. So when I heard on September 5, 1986, that Hank Greenberg had died the day before, I decided that I had to go make a film on Hank Greenberg because I grew up Jewish in Detroit, and every Yom Kippur, my dad, always talked about Hank Greenberg. And whenever we would be driving to Kol Nidra services, my dad would talk about Hank in 1934 now playing on Yom Kippur. As a matter of fact, I heard about Hank so often on Kol Nidra, I always thought that Hank Greenberg was part of Kol Nidra services. <laughs> Hank Greenberg himself was not a religious Jew. What makes him an important figure in American Jewish history? Hank's parents were immigrant Romanians. They spoke Yiddish at home. They had Shabbos every Friday night. But when a pennant race where Hank was the lead hitter and he chose to go to synagogue instead, I think was a definitive moment in the practice of Judaism for American Jews because it was the first time the broader secular population knew from our holiday. There were headlines in the paper, Happy New Year, Hank. I mean, the other thing you have to understand that when Hank chose not to play in 34. It was the height of domestic anti-Semitism, especially in Detroit, where Ford had distributed the protocols of Zion for free at his dealerships, uh, the rise of Father Cosm later on in Michigan, viewing his 
hatred over the radio waves, uh, anti-black, anti-Jewish. There was all the reasons Hank Greenberg should have played that day on Young Kippur, but he didn't. And I think it set a standard for how Jews practice Judaism in America. A review of your film in Entertainment Weekly says that perhaps the most radical and trailblazing aspect of Hank Greenberg's career was simply his decision to retain his surname and remain proudly public about his religious identity. Do you agree with that? Back then there was a lot of pressure to change your name, but Greenberg uh, kept the full name, and I think it's true that in keeping that he was very visibly Jewish, and unfortunately it meant that he had a lot of anti-Semitic slurs yelled at him. Every day he went to bat, he had some heckling either from the opposing team or from the stadium about being Jewish. What was the most interesting or surprising thing you learned while making this film? If you want to know what the real surprise was, one day I'm filming two rabbis. So we're sitting there at lunch and all of a sudden, Rabbi Brenner says to Rabbi Dickman, you know, uh, when you were young, or when you were in synagogue, did you sit there and play prayer book baseball? And I said, man, what are you talking about? And so they explained it to me, and I said to my cameraman, I said, Tom, we got to get this. So we filmed how they used to open the Siddur, the prayer book, and just depending where their finger would go, they got to first or second or third base. It's sort of fantasy, synagogue, baseball. The film is a little bit like a collage made up of archival footage and clips from feature films, interviews, still photos, music. Can you talk a little about the art of making documentaries and how you take all those random pieces and make a coherent story out of them? I think the fun part is finding those mosaic of footage. There's a lot of World Series footage, but movies of the day sometimes represent what's happening, and there was some great baseball movies I could draw from. But, you know, if you want to talk about domestic anti-Semitism, Gentleman's Agreement to me is the riveting, most important American film ever made about that. And I use the scene where Gregory Peck, who's playing a writer who's passing as a Jew, can't get into a hotel because he's Jewish. And I wanted to show that later on when Hank was an owner, that happened to him in Phoenix in the 50s. I hope this film inspires young Jewish boys and girls to play baseball. It took me 13 years to make this film because I had to raise the money. On one hand, it's not easy to make films about people who have died. On the other hand, it gives you a great sense of responsibility and gratification to make films about heroes from the past so people can learn from their struggles as well as from their accomplishments. It was just an honor to make the film about Hank. Aviva Kempner, thanks so much for speaking with us. And it was a pleasure talking to you. This is the 18th episode of the Book of Life, and it's time to say hi. Personally, I want to say hi to every Book of Life listener, and a special shout-out to listeners at our home base, Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. I also want to thank my husband, Jonathan, who goes above and beyond to support my podcasting habit. Now, let's hear from you. Steve Bergson of Toronto, Canada, sends out a L'chaim greeting to Jana Burkhalter of Shamba, Iowa. Hello from Enid to my dear friend Ellen. Didn't we have fun at the Santa Monica Library last month, she says. You can tell my stories anytime. To Jonathan in Vermont, happy anniversary to us. Love from Denise. From Maureen at Levine Academy in Dallas, Texas, to all my wonderful friends in AJL. To Abraham Amshin in Louisville, Kentucky. Hello from Lori, Jess, Ariel, Ron, and Daniel in North Wales, Pennsylvania. Wendy Wassman wants to send a hi to Linda Silver in Cleveland, Ohio, and to tell her thanks for being a great mentor and advisor. Hugs and kisses to Carly Rose Milliken from her Auntie Sue, with best wishes for many years of reading wonderful Jewish books. Susan Burson says good luck to Kathy Steinberg in the Library of Congregation Emmanuel in Denver, Colorado, from her predecessor. Hope you can hang in there for 13 years like I did. 
Ada Gold at Temple Beth Am in Miami sends out a great big hi to all her wonderful mother-daughter book club friends. And Rachel Kamen at Temple Israel Libraries and Media Center in West Bloomfield, Michigan, says hi to all the members of the Temple Israel book clubs. And finally, Congregation Har Shalom in Durango, Colorado, wishes a Rocky Mountain high to all our members and friends. And they say, remember kids, you can win fabulous prizes by reading Jewish books this summer. And mention this podcast to win a special secret prize. Just One More Book is a thrice-weekly podcast about children's books created by a Canadian husband and wife team. Several mornings a week, they visit their favorite coffee shop, where they record an enthusiastic commentary about the books they've been enjoying with their daughters Lucy and Bela. I asked Andrea and Mark to review Across the Alley by Rich Michelson because I knew it was a book they love. So today we've got a show within a show for you. It's a little longer than our usual Book of Life segments, but well worth it, and will be followed by an interview with the author himself. You can hear more from Andrea and Mark at justonemorebook.com. Just one more book, please, sir. Uh, yeah. What? We're serious. Serious what? Just one more book, please. Please, please. Come on over here, please. Okay. <laughs> I got him. <laughs> I'm Mark. I'm Andrea. And today we're honored to be guests of the Book of Life podcast. Thank you very much, Heidi, for inviting us to include our review of Across the Alley by Richard Michelson and illustrated by Evie Lewis on your show. And this is, uh, Richard Michelson has been a guest of our show before. And what a creative and talented and incredibly generous guy. With such a range of, with such a range of, uh, topics and styles and and such a generous way of being. Oh, absolutely. He, um, In addition to doing children's books, he's also written poetry and he has a gallery and oh, well, you, you check out yeah. the interview. You, yeah, you really, I mean, like, he explains it so well. Uh, I'd, I'd rather not steal his thunder. This is such a, an amazing book. This is my favorite of his books. Oh, yeah. He, um, he packs in... I always say, like, what, three or four major oh, storylines? Everything is packed into this book, and it's packed in such a way that you don't even notice it. It's just written as a really simply told, really simply illustrated, although the illustrations are gorgeous and realistic and evocative, but when you look at it, the simplicity of the story is so deceptive because it's just handling issues and ideas and so elegantly. It really, it, like, it's amazing that it has so much in it. And, you really and it's don't so entertaining. I mean, Lucy uh, and Bella are squirming in their seats and ex- excited and in suspense and then celebrating. You know, it has all the components of the perfect story. Oh, yeah. So it's a story of um, two boys, and it's back in the, in the dark ages. Well, not the dark ages. It's, like, back in, like, the, the heyday of... of well, well I mean, it's the book, segregation, right? It's, it's during segregation, well, but it's back in the heyday of, 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 of the jazz culture, and the Negro Leagues are very popular then, and so, I mean, it's, it's like baseball is still like a central part of American culture at this point. And racism is, And too. racism, of course, yeah. So, um, so they're two boys, and they live across the alley from, their windows, bedroom windows happen to be across the alley from each other, and although they're not allowed to associate with each other, one is Jewish and one is not. One is black, one is not. And so, although they're not allowed to associate with each other during the day, and and although their paths have been kind of strictly set out for them by their Divergent. families, yeah, yeah like um, the Jewish boy should not waste his time with sports. He should he should aspire to be a great musician, and the black boy should not. You know, he should he should be a, a sports god because that's what his father wants him to be. What I love is the frame of reference because for the little black boy, the frame of reference is Satchel Page, and for the Jewish boy, it's Yasha Heifetz. Those don't mean anything to me when I read them. I can't even pronounce them. I know, but it's just it's just the the, the frame of reference. Okay. So like in their two worlds, one is so focused on music, one is so oh, focused on baseball, okay. but pitching specifically. Because the, the little black boy's name uh, 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 is Willie, and um, and 
he, his uh, father was a pitcher in the Negro Leagues, and now he coaches baseball. And so Willie Willie's a pitcher in his in his little league baseball team. So for me, there's two big things in this book, or three maybe. There's the expectations, right? Because they oh, well, we didn't talk about what happened still. So they oh, yes. they so they're being forced in these directions. They're being separated because of their you know ancestors, basically, and they're um, but. They don't really, it's not like they're taking a big stand against it. They just, when they're sent to the rooms at night, over time they've realized that they can see each other and they've they have become a life friends. Yeah. yeah, and so what for them they're not making a big statement. They just, each night, they crank their windows open, even when if it's freezing cold or whatever, and share, you know, their talents. share their talents. Yeah, and and the one who's, try, who's kind of being directed to be musical is more athletic and the one who's directed to be more athletic is more musical so what they do is they kind of wish they were in the opposite position but they don't talk like that it's just naturally they just naturally exchange the learning that they've been given that doesn't really apply to them because it's not their That's it's right. not their best area and right? eventually they both excel in those areas yeah. but what's really important is how their, their friendship excels, and it brings together the two families. Yeah. And in one day, at the very, like, so Willie ends up learning how to play the violin, and Abe is practicing for recital, and Willie's teaching Abe how to pitch. And in one day, everything comes together, where the two families walk down the street side by side, and they're both so proud. Yeah. And they get to the temple where the where the where the recital takes place, and Willie does his recital, and he starts off a little shaky, and I then, love then that, yeah. yeah, and then he closes his eyes, and just it flows, and, and and everything is beautiful, and then they go from that to the baseball game, directly, diamond, yeah, and Abe is the opening pitcher for the baseball game, and he kind of falters in the beginning, and then sees everybody's cheering him on, and then his next pitch goes across the plate. It's just such it's so good, a and you know, there's book. so many billions of things I like to say about this. Just right off the bat, I like to say, what I, one thing I like is that they're not all stars. They're not, you know, all they, they falter when they when they finally have their their time to perform. They do falter and they're and they're human. And then they they pick up, and then they have the support of the people that they're with. And so it's not one of those stories where they're the best violin player in the world, or everyone puts them on their shoulders and every they win the wonderful la la la. Right? It's just a very these are the kind of stories I like where it's, you know, you're being accepted for what you are, you're being accepted for your talents, and you're accepting that they're being nurtured, and you're being appreciated for for doing your best, right? And I really, really like that. I also like the fact that they're also very accepting of the fates that have apparently been chosen for them, right? Like one of them, Willie, is going to be a pitcher because his dad was a pitcher. And Abe is going to be a violin player because his grandfather was a violin player, right? It's almost like, it's, it, I wouldn't say that they don't have a choice or that they're not enjoying it, but it's almost like their, their paths are being curved and they're just so accepting. It's like, oh, I've got to practice for my recital or, oh, I have to practice for <laughs> No, they don't seem to, to uh, rebel against it. Yeah. But that's one thing, another thing I really love about this. Well, for, I wanted to say also, the way things are described is so perfect. There are all these, the descriptions are all often compared you know, to like the Coney Island, Island Ferris wheel oh, or being on a right. roller coaster are really, really fun analogies that they use. Just that he, so Richard just manages to, in such tiny amount of text, you know, create so much they by so his many choice. Pictures in your mind. Yeah, oh, by his yeah. choice of comparison, his choice of words. So, but I wanted to say that the, the whole expectations things, right? Because they, because of the history of the families, they put, they just, just burden these kids with these expectations and there's not like no one in this book is complaining right but it's just good to see you know they're burdened with these expectations and and it's nice to see that you know it's not realistic and it's nice to see that people are different and they have different talents and just be able to understand something about yourself like, yeah like, I'm not good sometimes because I think we give kids the impression we throw everything at them we expect them we expect them to get a certain reach a certain level in everything but you know it's not realistic and I think we don't actually tell them that except for if they happen to be failing at something right so I think it's good to see you know people are different people have different strengths and weaknesses and you know and to see that the that the parents actually accept it when they when they discover this is really good the understanding aspect too I wanted to talk about is that you know 
the race thing is all very obvious, right? And it's and it's extremely well done. We're not talking about it because it's, 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 it's quite obvious. Really, yeah. But what I mean is, it's obvious that that this is a really um, helpful central piece, yeah. and central part. But yeah. I did want to talk about the understanding thing because in the book, the I think you know the two the the two cultures don't understand each other. They don't accept each other. They don't appreciate each other. And also the. The, the adults don't understand their kids and um, the kids don't necessarily understand themselves or they don't articulate it right and I what I like is that how through the book those different things are that those understandings and appreciations are, are resolved a bit and what another thing that I like is um, how um, Abe explains that well my grandfather wants me to be to excel at violin because you know, he, the Nazis did this. He was a very talented musician, and the, the Nazis broke his fingers and treated him like a slave. And it's just that the boy is showing that he can understand someone's situation, like can, you, you know, and and kind of accept and appreciate the way the person is as a result. You know, the boy sets the example first, kind of thing. And then I also like that um, Willie is so stunned to learn. You know. Oh, your ancestors were slaves too, and what a big difference oh, yeah. that understanding makes about that. Yes, to right. him, you know. And so, I don't know how it's like that his he eyes open up to, suddenly. Yeah, yeah, and how understanding makes such a big difference. And anyway, that's what I mean. There's we haven't even touched on it, but well, what, there's a million things. But we could a hold in a whole extra episode on other things we love about this book. Beautiful book. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi, for including us in the Book of Life. Thanks again to Andrea and Mark for doing a review upon request. Now we'll hear from Rich Michelson, the author of Across the Alley. It was named a notable children's book of Jewish content by the Association of Jewish Libraries, and it was a National Jewish Book Award finalist as well. Rich is the author of many picture books, as well as poetry for adults, and he's the owner of the R. Michelson Galleries in Northampton, Massachusetts, which featured children's illustration along with other fine art. We spoke to him by phone at his home in Amherst, Massachusetts. What was your inspiration for this story? Well, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood in East New York, Brooklyn, and it became a black neighborhood. The whites, mostly Jewish at that time, were on one street, and the blacks were on another street, and we tended not to cross the line. I read an interesting comment on your book in a customer rev review on Amazon.com. The reviewer, Marcy Twain, says, I'm curious why the author makes it an issue that the white kid was Jewish. He never mentioned the black kid's faith. Were the kids supposed to stay apart because they had different religions or because their skin color was different? How would you respond to that? Well, I would respond that uh, when I was growing up, we were really conscious of skin color, less so religion. In general, uh, you know, the book is more about segregation due to skin color. Uh, in this story, there's a moment where Abe talks a little bit about his grandfather working like a slave in a Nazi concentration camp. And Willie is quiet for a moment and then mentions, my great-granddaddy was a slave, too. I never knew any white folk that were. They come to see where each of them have come from and the similarities in their backgrounds. The institutionalized racism that kept Abe and Willie apart is, at least to some extent, gone now. Why do you feel it's important to show modern kids what those times were like? Well, I came of age during a time when Jews were considered the best friends of uh, blacks in the civil rights movement, and there was a real bond, and uh, they were often on the same side of the political agenda. Um, I think that in many ways today there is a divide and I think that it's important to talk about times when this was uh, overcome um, how it can be overcome I think race today in this country is as much an issue as it's ever been tell us about E.B. Lewis's illustrations for Across the Alley oh aren't they wonderful yes um, <laughs> This is the second book that E.B. and I have worked on together, and during that time, he's become a special friend. He considers himself a black Israelite. Uh, his facility with watercolor is just absolutely incredible. The emotion he gets into the children. It's interesting, I think, at the beginning, you see both the 
these boys in a little bit of shadow, and it's hard at first to even tell which is which. And I think that's a nice touch. It's funny, when I wrote this story, of course, I had my old neighborhood in mind, and now it's hard for me to distinguish between my family and my old apartment buildings and the ones that uh, E.B. has created here. He's so He's given so much life to this story. I'm just very thankful for that. What are you working on next? Right now there's a book that will be out in the spring 08 that is called As Good as Anybody, Martin Luther King and Abraham Joshua Heschel's Amazing March Towards Freedom. And that is a book uh, about the friendship of these two great men and how they each came to each other's aid in times of need. And I'm working on a Jewish alphabet for the younger set called A is for Abraham, basically a cultural Jewish American alphabet that introduces everything you need to know about Judaism as a starter kit. Um, the picture books has been a really a melding of the two great loves of my life, poetry and painting. And to see them come together in a book just still gives me a chill every time. Rich Michelson, thanks so much for speaking with us. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Special thanks this month to Hungry for Music, who gave us permission to use their baseball-related music from the CD Diamond Cuts, Bottom of the Fifth. Hungry for Music is a nonprofit organization that inspires underprivileged children using the power of music. Check them out at hungryformusic.com. We would love to hear from you, so email bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com, post a comment on our website, or if your computer has a microphone, leave a two-minute voice message by clicking on the My Jingo link on our website at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. You can also add your pin to our Frabber map to show us where you're listening from. The Book of Life is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries, tending the Tree of Knowledge and promoting Jewish reading by supporting Judaic libraries and librarians. Visit them on the web at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band from Sacramento, California, whose CDs feature upbeat music from the Ashkenazic and Sephardic traditions with Brazilian, Gypsy, and Celtic influences. Borrow their CDs at the Feldman Library or buy your own copies at freilachmakers.com. To download episodes of the Book of Life podcast, visit us on the web at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. That's jewishbooks, one word, dot B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. Links to the books, CDs, and videos mentioned on the show are available on this website. You can also hear the latest episode by phone. Just call 916-313-3820. Thanks for listening, and happy reading! Happy reading!